Thanks for being here, folks. Um, yeah, tonight we're going to talk about why native plants matter, um, why they're so incredibly important for our ecosystems and our gardens. Um, my background was given a little bit already, but just to reiterate, I own Driftless Area Natives now. I purchased it this last fall from Joyce Selecki. It's been around since 2015, uh, providing native plants to our region uh, since then, which is fantastic. And so upholding that mission um, to provide organically grown uh, native plants to our Driftless Area. And right now we've got over 100, like 150 different varieties of things, so it's very exciting. Um, with that, I'm also a lead designer at Cooley Region Ecoscapes, so I get to put the plants that I grow into landscapes, which turns out is really great for ecosystems as well as really great for business. Um, but we emphasize at Cooley Region Ecoscapes in residential, commercial, and multifamily unit developments. Um, we also have been working with the city a lot um, with uh, their boulevards and general streetscapes to try to add more native plants to those areas. Uh, we've won the Soak It Up Award on multiple occasions. Uh, that award is gifted to people that have exemplified exceptional work with stormwater mitigation using native plants and engineering. Um, lastly, I'm an instructor of horticulture at Western Technical College. I teach landscape design. I teach plant identification. So. Um, we're going to have fun tonight. That's my background. I went to school at the University, this isn't even up there, but you get a little insight. Um, I went to the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities, as a golden gopher. I went to school for architecture and landscape architecture with an emphasis on community-oriented design and development. So you're like, how did this guy end up with plants? Well, you can thank my mother, who is here tonight uh, for introducing me to gardening. Got the itch and it's stuck. So. Here we are, talking about landscape design. Can, can I ask you a real quick question? Sure. So, about the Driftless Area Native, and if you uh -huh. purchased that, uh -huh. it used to be located in Tremblo at her house. So is it, and I noticed that recently it says it's located in Galesville. It right? is, yes. Does it have a location change then? So there is a location change, and there's also a ordering change, which I've been getting a lot of emails about. And so if you follow me, on Facebook, okay. I have business cards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? This guy, he's serious. I also have stickers if you like stickers better, but um, you can certainly take both. <laughs> um, but I have a website now, or Driftless Area Natives, Dan, as I refer to it, has a website, and so you can place your orders on the website, and then I have a couple different CSA locations where I will drop off the plants, because as you can see, oh God, okay. I have a couple other jobs, and so like having a physical retail space that I will sit at and wait for people to come is not something that Dan will offer anymore. Sadly, sad face, but I will be at farmer's markets. I'll be at the Onalaska farmer's market um, during the summer just to be able to arrange pickups, but just email me. I'm pretty friendly. We can organize a spot. I will get you your plants, I promise. So it's just going to look a little different uh, in that regard. So any other questions? And feel free to ask during the presentation. This is clearly informal if you haven't gathered that already, but um, cool. Okay, so the context of what we're talking about tonight has to do with current landscaping practices, or rather like 90s into the early 2000s landscaping practices, which is very, very, it emphasizes very, very much non-native plants. I like daylilies too, but like there's a lot of them. There's so many daylilies. Then you've got honeysuckle, You've got a very, very blurry picture of barberry. So these kinds of things, two of these in particular, if you're an avid hiker in our region, you've probably seen them out of context, which is very bad. You know, we want these to stay in garden beds, but they just don't because they're invasive species. And so this current paradigm of landscaping is not only putting in non-native plants into people's yards, therefore being ecologically worthless, like I don't, I don't mean to dig on any of these plants, but they provide no ecological benefit. They're also escaping and affecting our local parks and just general ecosystems. And they also require a lot more fertilizers and pesticides because they're not used to growing in this environment. They require a lot of input. And so you create this kind of nasty cycle of non-native plants herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers, good old Roundup. Um, so that's the problem. And then the impacts. So they do affect our understories in our parks. 
on Hinkson. There's a lot of honeysuckle. There's a lot of Japanese barberry. There's also a lot of like Siberian squill, also called um, Scylla, Scylla, however you want to say it, potato, potato, you know. So these things are replacing native plants that would otherwise grow in those areas and then not providing anything for insects, pollinators, and other wildlife. Now, I like hydrangeas too. I think they're pretty. I also like um, hostas as well in the right area. This is the overarching theme tonight is for me to not, I'm not trying to say like, don't you dare plant any of these <laughs> ever because I will not like you. Because I like them too. It's just understanding the fact that like, just because you put something in your garden does not mean it's going to stay in your garden, right? A lot of this stuff escapes and can have nasty impacts. Except for hostas, they kind of hang out. So, that's the impact, right? Detrimental to local ecosystems, spreads out, replaces native plants. That's a problem, turns out. Because we live in a very, very, very interconnected world. Not only uh, in regards to ecosystems, it turns out, but also in there's a societal interconnectedness that we are all experiencing during year three of this global pandemic. But growing native plants helps us to become a part of that interconnected system rather than trying to control it and stand outside of it and stand above it. And if you didn't know this already, a lot of your food, i.e. one out of every three bites of food that you eat is pollinated by a pollinator. So like when we're knocking these guys down with neonicotinoids and all kinds of other good stuff that we're using to try to control the practices of non-native plants and monoculture and agriculture, all that good stuff, we're actually making our lives a lot more difficult than they have to be. So, again, native plants. If I haven't won you over yet, I will. I promise. You got some beautiful apple blossoms. You got a little uh, tomato blossom there. You got a little, another little apple blossom. And that is not a fruiting plant, but it's pollinators on a blazing star. Just beautiful. So, we have a duty to be a good host, right? We all own land, we all own, even if you just have a little garden pot at your apartment that sits on your porch, you can plant stuff that's gonna be incredibly beneficial to local pollinators. And a lot of those pollinators are actually fairly specific. There's, you can dive into a lot of different types of bees and insects, specialists as they are called, and they have co-evolved with particular plants. Um, has anyone ever seen one of these before? Do you know, what is that? <laughs> They're crazy, right? They look so weird. Like, how did that evolve? How did that become part of our ecosystem? But it's hanging out on that Minarda, and it is having a great time. So if you want to see those, plant some Minarda. But a lot of these particular insects have evolved, um, have co-evolved with these particular plants to be able to pollinate them and to be able to interact with them in a beneficial way. So when you remove the plant, the food source, for these pollinators, they're going to wander around looking for something that they're not going to find. Um, and so with that, providing pollen, providing nectar for these pollinators is very, very important if you want to see them. And it turns out that some of these are incredibly needy, maybe that's the word, incredibly specific, like the monarch butterfly. Like, it needs milkweed to go through its life cycle. If we don't have milk, we don't have monarchs. And monarch populations have declined substantially. They are in a little bit of an uptick, which is exciting, because people are planting milkweed, which it needs, because that's a host plant. So there's host plants specifically for swallowtail butterflies as well, uh, golden alexander, spice bush. Um, if you have any like garden dill uh, in your garden and stuff, you'll probably see swallowtails hanging out, because it turns out that. Golden Alexander and Dill are like in the same family, the Umbeliferous family, where they've got the little flat top inflorescence, right? So it's very cool to see those interactions. And then lastly, another one that's um, coming more to the forefront. It doesn't quite have the same traction that the monarch has gained over time, uh, but the Carter Blue Butterfly is specific to wild lupin, which is something that Dan is trying to grow a lot of a lot more of, as well as Cooley Region Ecoscapes is trying to implement more into landscapes to try to help out this adorable little butterfly. And I don't know if any of you have seen wild lupin in person before, but like the flowers are big, but they're not that big. So these little blue butterflies are really tiny and they're so beautiful. And so 
Without Wild Lupin, we don't have Carter Blues. Without Spicebush and Golden Alexander, we don't have these. Without Milkweed, we don't have these. So you start to remove these particular plants and you start to um, eliminate certain species, which is very sad. Now, I'm not going to dive too much into this because this is like above and beyond why native plants matter. If you want to talk about this kind of stuff, we can chat later. But just in general, a house plant allows, in this instance, a butterfly to go through its entire cycle, right? Egg to larva to pupa to the adult butterfly, and then it gets out of Dodge and heads south where it's a lot warmer. <laughs> I wish I was further south right now. <laughs> um, so the egg, it just hangs out, it gets planted on milkweed. I'm sure some of you have turned over a milkweed leaf and seen little dots. They almost look like dandruff or something. They're, they're not cute, you know, they're not cute eggs. But then they turn into the caterpillar that gradually get larger and larger and then they're eating the foliage. Now, I've gotten many, many calls from people that are like, I have this like swamp milkweed in my, in my property and there are all these bite marks out of it. Like what's eating my plant? This is terrible. And it's like, no, 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 that's good. That's what you want. Like, if, if your plant is being eaten, that means that it is partaking and in, enmeshed into that ecosystem. If, you're, if your plants aren't being eaten, that means they have no value. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Yes. So, like, you want things to eat your plants. Obviously not until they die. Like, I've had my fair share of fights with rabbits before, but... <laughs> <laughs> I just relocate them. I'm not, you know... Um, but anyways, so caterpillars are feeding on your foliage, or little, little bugs and insects are feeding on the foliage because they're beneficial. Then the larvae turn into the chrysalis, right? So they're hanging out, they're so cool. It's amazing how quickly, once they form, and then you're waiting for them to emerge, waiting for them to emerge, and all of a sudden they're just done. And then you're like, where did the butterfly go? And then you got this really unflattering thing, and then it turns into this beautiful butterfly that flies around. Now, all of these stages are completed in one year. All these stages are dependent upon having a host plant. So, plant milkweed. Please, if you don't have it already, plant wild lupin, plant spice bush, all those. Yes? What kind of conditions does a wild lupin like? I've tried to go and I can't. So the wild lupin is a bit of a finicky one, for sure. Um, the latest recommendations that I've been giving people has been to direct sow them into an area that's got Sandier soil, full sun. They hate clay. They will. They will not do well. If you live on the ridge top, I'm sorry, you just can't. You can't grow it <laughs> um, unless you like put it in a pot and have a more sandy soil or something. They like full sun. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Give them full sun. I mean, they will. They will. Call, I mean, even in this last uh, photograph, you can see it's kind of in an understory. So when it gets established in the right conditions, it will proliferate quite, quite readily. But it's like getting it going. That's kind of the bear. Um, but yeah, if you have clay soil. Don't do it. The other thing to consider with like, so when I say direct sow, that means like put the seed in the ground where the plant's gonna grow rather than starting it and trying to transplant it. Because a lot of these legumes like this, these particular plants have tap roots. And so tap roots do not transplant very well. It's like trying to transplant a carrot. It doesn't work. Don't do it. So, but that being said, I'm growing it and I'm gonna be providing it. So, but I have, I have tricks. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> trade, trade secrets, we'll talk. Um, but yeah, I would try direct sowing it into sandy, full sun areas, and then water it, get it established, and it should come around for you. Um, prairie moon or prairie moon nurse, or prairie moon nursery or prairie moon both sell seeds. Um, they're good resources to purchase those seeds, and I'll show them at the end of the PowerPoint as well, too because that's another very important part, is where you're getting your seeds from. So, is there hope or is all lost? I think that there's hope because we have people like you that are choosing to show up and are interested. If your interest is peaked, that's great, because if you leave here and you plant one Monarda in your yard or you plant one um, Blue Vervain in your, in your yard, I'm gonna be incredibly heartwarmed and hopeful because in an urban environment even if you plant a five foot by five foot pollinator patch keep in mind that there's you know like 60,000 people in the cross if every single person takes part in this we can make a huge huge impact and how many of you like birds all right cool that's great so it just turns out that 
adding in native plants, adding in native forbs, i.e. flowering plants like this, is really beneficial to birds. Because that is a slide that's coming after I talk about roots. Woo! <laughs> 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 um, quick little digression here. Gotta go underground first before we go above ground. <laughs> He's so prepared. Um, so, plant roots. Okay, before we talk about birds. Native plants, look at these root systems. Now, if you can read this, this says feet. That's one foot, two feet, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, all the way to fifteen. Eager beaver, cylindric blazing star is just, just trying to burrow into the mantle of the earth or something. So, these native plants and these root systems have an incredible impact on drought tolerance. If you like looking out at a brown lawn in the middle of the summer, you're lying to yourself. Plant some native plants because they'll stay green because the root systems are so much deeper. So with that, they require significantly less maintenance once established. Every plant needs a little love in the first few months. If you don't give it to them, then they're not going to make it, which is sad, and we do see that. But these root systems also have an incredible interaction. Again, we're back to talking about these plants evolving in this particular region, you know, for the last however many thousands of years, they have an amazing relationship with the native bacteria and the fungi in the soil that allow them to effectively filter out pollutants and other junk and these kinds of things. Now the city of La Crosse and Western Technical College are starting to implement these things called bioswales, which is this fancy word for a rain garden with a particular kind of soil in it that's like 70% sand, 30% compost, okay? So you've got these bacteria and fungi that are abundant in the compost that are interacting with these plant roots that are helping to filter out stormwater pollution in urban environments, which stormwater pollution in an urban environment is very, very bad and very, very abundant, unfortunately, because you have a lot of impervious surface and all the water runs off, and then it goes into our stormwater systems, and then our streets flood, and you get to hydroplane, which is really fun. Or you get stuck in intersections. But the city is working on that and trying to implement more opportunities for that water to naturally infiltrate into these wondrous root systems, cleaning it out, helping to keep our rivers cleaner. Not only that, but some of these plants, let's see if I can find the right one. So this one, white wild indigo, um, big old tap root. So this guy has a really cool relationship with a particular kind of rhizobacteria that allows it to add nitrogen to the soil, taking atmospheric nitrogen, converting it into usable nitrogen in the soil. We call it a nitrogen fixer. Now what that does is that prevents you from having to buy fertilizer from Menards and put it on the top because this plant is doing it for you. It just keeps doing it as it gets bigger and bigger. So use plants. They know what they're doing. Yes. Can I ask a root question? You can ask um, a root question. Oh, excellent. Um, trees are bothersome sometimes with roots and starting. I love trees. I'm not against trees. But <laughs> we have, we have a, a lot of trees that have been brought in that are root hogs. And <laughs> yeah. they take over. Any recommendations on types for this area? Types of trees? Yes. Because uh, there's so many maples. And I like maples, but they drive me nuts, okay? Yeah, I, I, I probably feel the same way that you okay. do. I, maples are beautiful, don't get me wrong, but yes, there, there are far too many maples. Okay. <laughs> Autumn blaze maples are everywhere. Yes. And they're very pretty right now because they're turning red, you know, but turns out monoculture trees are bad, bad, not good too. Look at the elms, look at the ash, and how urban environments completely change because they all die from a disease coming through and wiping them out. But recommended trees. Um, Is that another talk you can tell me that? Yeah, so come back next week and we'll have another. <laughs> all right, all right. It'll be a tree. It's no. A um, yeah. So like, there are a lot of great native oak trees that yes. grow very, very well. If you're planting pollinator plants like these, and you're doing like the oak savanna aesthetic, like yeah. plant a burrow, you know, those kinds of things. They grow super, super, super slow. Um, but some of the more like beneficial, um, so like oak trees and white pines have kind of the higher number of um, being beneficial for a plethora of like Lepidoptera or you know butterflies and moss being a house plant for those. So like if you're looking to increase the number of those in your yard, plant either an oak or a white pine. 
Um, if you want songbirds, I would plant like some showy mountain ash or um, even like ironwood or muscle wood. Those are a couple of my other favorites. Or serviceberry trees are really great too. Um, now you notice in the talk like, and this is just the general issue that we're experiencing with climactic alterations. I'm not going to say the buzzword climate change, but you know, because um, I don't want to cause any rifts, but we are seeing growing zones shifting. So things are growing in the cross that didn't used to. We can plant eastern red buds here now with no problem and they don't die anymore, which is cool because they're really pretty and their flowers make a great tincture and a mix for cocktails, but <laughs> um, this, is a, this is a 21 and up talk. Um, you can, we can fight as much as we want to keep these ecosystems as pure as possible, which is commendable and it's something that we do. And also, um, like the, the famed clover lawn, okay? So native lawns, monoculture, Kentucky bluegrass, whatever you pick, taking those lawns of monoculture and planting clovers in them, which are typically like a Japanese white clover or something, that is actually providing something to local pollinators. So if you're gonna have a lawn and you put non-native clover in it, it's kind of like, okay, like that's cool. You don't want to put in a big prairie installment, but at least you're putting in something. So that's just to say like, there are a lot of great native trees. There are also some that are like getting there. They will be yeah. in a hundred years or a thousand years. So anyways. Thank you. Yeah, you've all been warned. If you ask me questions, I will <laughs> keep talking. Hi, what are the birds now? That's great. Okay, let's sing along. Um, <laughs> so, when you plant native plants, not only are you stabilizing your soil, adding to the soil, preventing erosion, <laughs> very good, right? You're also encouraging the abundance of native birds and finches and all kinds of good stuff because, yeah, some of them like the seeds, like goldfinches will just totally wipe out echinacea cones like they're just gone in the in the winter so quickly because they love them then you got hummingbirds on your lobelia on your cardinal flower and then you've also got another goldfinch hanging out on a high bush cranberry kind of thing so they're munching not only are they eating the seeds and the fruits but if you're hosting a bunch of caterpillars and worms on these native plants you're also going to be providing food for your birds now you don't want birds to come in and eat your monarch caterpillars in theory but if you have like a thousand of them that eat 100 or 200 like you know you're in the you're in the green more or less so <laughs> bringing in native plants attracts caterpillars and worms which attracts birds you see how it's all interconnected and so this is going to help you save thousands of dollars on bird seed okay because bird seed is expensive so why not grow it instead you know like you can do that I promise so this is all to say, like, plant native plants, because they're providing food and beauty for these guys, which are only wanting love, and just to be left alone in many, many cases. But, what do you want to plant? Now that is a very good question. I wouldn't dare leave you tonight by not, without giving you some recommendations. That would be ridiculous. So, there's a fantastic book um, called Native Pollinators by Heather Holmes. Um, write that down. It's a fantastic book. It talks all about the insect interactions um, between all the native flowers and other forbs uh, and grasses and these particular insects. It goes into like kleptoparasitoids and parasitoids and all these crazy words that you probably never heard before, but they're all very good. Learn about them. I'm not going to bore you with them tonight. But the first four that I'm going to talk about or recommend to you are stated in this book and it was a study that was done in 2007 by Michigan State. Now these were selected because of their quality of nectar and pollen that they're providing, right? So these things have high lipid contents and other things that make them very, very beneficial, right? They're like the superfoods of your pollinator plants. You've got Golden Alexander, right? Which is also a house plant for what butterfly? Does anyone remember? I hear it being whispered. You can shout, it's okay, I'm shouting. 
Yes, I heard it a couple times, whispered very quietly. Swallowtail, right, Golden Alexander. You want to see swallowtails? Get some house plants with Golden Alexander in there. They also bloom very, very early, which is very important too. Granted, nothing is blooming right now because it's still second winter, but Golden Alexander, very good. Canada anemone. Now this is another really, really cool one that is a great like living mulch that'll spread out. It proliferates quite readily and it looks really, really adorable in the fall with these little tufts. Um, you got spotted bee balm, which is another really good one. Now, fewer people know about this bee balm. It's, in the, it's a monarda, right? So it's, this, it's related to the wild bergamot that you're all probably familiar with, or the scarlet bee balm, or the other bee balms that exist. Now this one is less showy to some, but I think it's amazing because you get these crazy spikes with these purple, and then if you look at them really, really closely, they're kind of freckled, almost leopard print. Now these guys bloom a lot, and they're also very prolific. They are in the mint family, so they spread like crazy. So share it with your friends or plant with caution. <laughs> um, and then we move on to like yellow coneflower, which now when you type in yellow coneflower into Google, you're gonna get a bunch of different types of yellow coneflower. Now this is Retibida pinata, which is different than the other yellow coneflowers that you might find. You might even pull up like, Sweet black-eyed Susan, and they'll be like, this is yellow coneflower. And you're like, no, it's not. It's not retibida. So, um, Pinata, if you look at the foliage, it's actually got kind of this pinnate foliage. So the, the leaves, you can kind of see them. But anyways, retibida, yellow coneflower, rock star. Moving on to the last three that are listed in this particular book, you've got cup plant, which gets very, very, very tall. Now, maybe I should just go through and like give you general heights. So, Golden Alexander, sorry, I'm all over the place tonight. Golden Alexander's like one to two feet, okay? It's not too crazy. Golden Alexander, or blah, 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 that's what I just said. Canada anemone is in that same kind of like two foot, maybe two and a half foot size class, okay? The spotted bee balm, two to three feet, more, more or less. Again, all this is with a grain of salt. If you get it in an optimal condition, it's gonna shoot out. So, and then yellow coneflower, yellow coneflower is kind of a wild card. Uh, we, uh, we plant it with the intention of it being a three to four foot tall plant, but we did dig up some last year that was eight feet tall. So you never know what you're gonna get. <laughs> it loved it there, um, but it loved it a little too much, and so we had to take it out. And I brought some home, so perk of being a landscaper. Um, but yeah, so three to four feet, eight plus. <laughs> Um, then moving on to cut plant, then now this one is notoriously like five to eight feet tall. Like it's very large, but it's so cool because this plant has evolved to have clasping leaves that it doesn't have any pedicles, right? The leaves itself do not have any little stems, so it actually wraps around the, the stem of this plant and forms a cup that collects water. And so you'll see all kinds of tree frogs that are coming over to this plant to drink the water in the cup that's collected when it rains and finches and so on and so forth. Now this tall drink of water actually gets like eight to 10 feet tall sometimes. Not usually more than 10 feet tall, but like six to 10, so put it in the back. <laughs> it's very aggressive. It, it's very aggressive too, it goes all over the place. And the word we're using is prolific. <laughs> but yes, so that's and that's the and that's the thing with like that's the the disadvantage to a lot of these rock star plants, which is the one. It's not a critique, but it's just a, a um, something to keep in mind with these recommended plants in this particular book. Is like yeah, like they're great, but if people are using them in, in small gardens, like. You don't just want a full, your five foot by 10 foot pollinator patch, you want to have some diversity. And so like, this guy is gonna <laughs> be very prolific. This one's gonna be fairly prolific. This one's gonna be incredibly prolific. And your neighbors are gonna get some too, which like, if you don't like your neighbors, that's not a bad thing. Then you can send it over and share the love. But, but yes, cut plant, quite aggressive, quite prolific. Um, Another good one is Great Blue Lobelia. Now this is the cousin to the cardinal flower, right? Which I'm sure everyone has seen and loves and they're so pretty and it was, I think it was last year that the riverbanks of the Mississippi like erupted 
with this beautiful display of cardinal flowers. It was unreal. It looked like the shorelines were on fire because there were just so many of these blooming red, the cardinal flowers in red. This is not red. This is great. Blue lobelia, they're in the same family. The flowers look very similar. But this one needs a little wetter soil. It also needs more sun. It can do okay in part sun, but the soil moisture is key. Now this is a great rain garden plant Not if you need something for that. So is this one, but like this will be the only rain garden plant you have, the cup plant. <laughs> so, great blue lobelia, rain garden-esque. Then you've got New England Aster. Now this is a weird one in that I have a couple um, that we planted at, at different places and some of them get like three feet tall consistently we don't do anything and they're just three feet tall and then we have other ones that are you know towering over five six feet tall so like again incredible variation makes it difficult to use these plants in more standardized landscaping practices but that's why you put in pollinator patches because if it looks wild they're doing it right um yes eric i know no, i'm thinking back to the uh diagram you had of the ruts you don't have to go back but Oh, I can. Have you got described the height of these plants? Uh huh. Uh, do they have a correspondingly deep root system typically? So the whole like as above, so below <coughs> adage that yeah, you know has yeah. been popularized with trees and, and, and so I, I should also tell you why I'm asking. Please. So I'm interested in these, but our topsoil goes down about 14 inches, and then we're bluff side rock. Or yeah. That kind of stuff. Sure. It, it, will they do well in that kind of an environment? So, yes, a hundred percent. So keep in mind that a lot of these plants, you know, the white wild indigo, um, small yellow indigo, cream indigo, these, these particular, I'm talking about these guys, just, you know, all of these are gonna do fantastic. They've all evolved to grow here. Like they're used to having junk, right? I mean, you walk on the side of the bluffs and there's like no topsoil, it's just sand and rock and you've got these beautiful little blue stem. Okay. And so they're like, they're great. If they, what we do see often is is actually too nutrient rich soil. So like little blue stem, for instance, is this even on here? No, uh, but yeah. it is. I missed it. Haha! -ha. There it is. So this guy, very upright in this particular. Oh my God! It's even highlighted. That's embarrassing. But. Um, <laughs> oh, humility is key, folks. Um, <laughs> So a little blue stem, when we planted this in like cream of the crop, we put down two inches of compost, it's got like eight inches of black gold dirt, and it grows very prolifically, but then it flops, because it's like I am drowning in nutrients. Whereas we planted this stuff in boulevards with this much topsoil and then compacted gravel and concrete chunks, and it's just like taken off. So. Do your best to like replicate. That's the other advantage with a lot of these native plants is they don't require so much soil amendment. Like if any of you have tried to grow like blueberries here, it's a nightmare because you have to, it's like the soil is not acidic. Let me make it acidic, but you can and they work eventually. But there's so much less work and they're so pretty. Like just plant and walk away more, more or less. But um, does that answer your question? Yes. And more, probably. <laughs> uh, they have a time limit on this, don't worry. Um, so now, this is the list from that particular book, Pollinators and Native Plants by Heather Holmes. Again, check it out, it's very good. Um, those stupendous seven, and they're actually, they compile a list of like 47 or something, but they gave the top seven that they like. Now these are Eric's editions, so, I've got a grass thrown in there. Switchgrass, panicum, virgatum, very, very good. Now why would you throw a grass in there? They're so boring. But their root systems are incredible if you're doing erosion mitigation. Plant these. Or sedges. Well, I'm not talking about sedges tonight because I could talk on them for hours. But switchgrass and native grasses also provide overwintering habitat for all the insects that you're trying to attract to your garden. So now keep in mind, and that's another little tangent, I'm asking all of you, i.e. recommending all of you, don't do anything in the fall in your gardens. Just like let them hang out. Don't do work. Sit inside, sit back. Because when you cut back your gardens two inches off the ground and you haul away the material or you light it on fire, 
you are burning all of those insects that have burrowed into the stems, into the hollow pith, and are trying to go to sleep. And so they're literally burning alive if you're burning them. I'm not trying to scare you, but um, basically don't do anything because that's where they're hanging out for the winter, and then they'll emerge in the spring, and that's very good. So I'm making your gardening lives easier. Um, when is a good time to burn? When is a good time to burn? So um, if you're burning a prairie, right? So a lot of, <laughs> which you might be. So prairie burns are typically happening, you know, anywhere. They can happen any time of year, right? And so it's kind of like, that's a little general statement. Wait until it's like above 50 degrees consistently. Is Night that, or day. I'm sorry? Night or day temperature. Um, daytime temperatures consistently above 50 degrees and then nighttime temperatures like it's hard to say because now it's been like oh it's good oh my gosh this is terrible oh it's good so um, generally like when you're starting to see insects emerge which typically again in a normal season will be occurring in you know now right in April so like end of March early part of April is like pretty solid to burn now my weird little transgression into prairie burning and stuff that's a little different where you are burning things earlier, but you're not doing it every single year, you're doing it, you know, you're alternating, and so you're giving those insects a chance to like repopulate. But again, that's another, pop, another discussion, which I'm going to bite my own tongue and keep myself from going down that rabbit hole. So yeah, above 50 degrees during the day. End of March, early part of April. Okay. Yeah? Does that go for um, clearing off your gardens too? Yeah. Yeah, and so that's, that's what I would recommend for clearing off your gardens too. Now, if you're like, if you got the itch and you're like, the sun's out, it's 55 degrees, it's the end of February, I really want to cut something and get outside, what you can do is take these things and cut them off like, you know, 18 inches off the ground, 16 inches off the ground, a lot of the insects are burrowing further down in there, cut your organic material off, lay it in your bed, and walk away. You don't have to haul it out of your beds at all. You can just lay it down and it'll disappear because you have all those microorganisms and other decomposers that are going to break that down for you really, really fast. You're adding organic material to your garden bed, reducing your need for fertilizers. See how this whole cycle kind of happens, letting it decompose there. So um, if you feel the itch to cut early, just cut it 18 inches off the ground and lay it in place. Don't haul it away because then the insects can still hang out there. Yeah. Can I ask a clarifying question? So, like, Please. Say, so, if you burn um, end of March, beginning of April, but they say like no mow May, right? So, like, because there's still insects burrowing. So, when, sure. Are you if you burn at that time, are you not affecting? The, are you getting there before or after? <laughs> That's so you're a very... not also killing those. Right, and I mean burrow. like. You know, my, my horrific, you know, horror show picture that I just painted of like you burning insects and stuff alive. I apologize. So I it's a powerful to imagery. <laughs> Too powerful. Um, so when you cut that organic material out and you lay it down by the end of March, early part of April, like I saw some, I saw some little tiny little butterflies flying around like at the end of March, you know, so they're awake, right? So they're, they're emerging out quite, quite early. Um, the only thing that they're doing is they're just like moving very slow because it's so cold and not, you know, warm blooded like us. So you're not going to burn all your insects alive at the end of March to the early May. So the no mow May thing is purely a result of like, so you have an increase in temperature, you have an increase in activity of pollinators. And so you have higher activity, i.e. a higher need for sustenance, right? So if you're mowing all of the first emerging flowers when they're all like waking up and getting after it, they're gonna be like, oh my God, I'm so tired. I'm just gonna go back to bed or I'm gonna sleep for a very long time. I'm not gonna say that they're gonna die. I just did, but <laughs> so no mome is, yeah, providing nutrition for the insects as they're waking up and like getting really, really active, not necessarily just waking up. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Cool. Dandelions. Yes, dandelions, don't mow your dandies. Um, if you can fight the urge. Uh, if you've got some string ephemerals growing in your garden, good on you, that's great. Um, yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of pretty spring things that pop up. Violets are so beautiful. Fight them so much, it's so silly. But um, yeah, does that answer your questions about 
whatever topic we were just talking about. <laughs> Great, okay, so um, this is another one of my favorites, blue false indigo, uh, which is in the same family as the white wild indigo or the cream indigo. Now these beautiful spikes of pea flowers, they're fixing nitrogen into the soil, making healthy soil, great tap roots. Um, now these guys you can treat like a shrub. They get like five feet wide and tall. They're gigantic. If you ever go into the YMCA, uh, Cooley Region Ecoscapes planted these along the edge of the parking lots because they act like a shrub in the summer, which is great, but then they die back in the winter and so you've got snow storage and they don't care if they're getting piled up. So if you have an area where you're like, I want some privacy in the summer or in the fall, plant some of these and you'll have a shrub and then it'll die back and you can bury it and it doesn't matter. So blue false indigo, very good. I will say that if you plant it somewhere, it will be there for the end of time. <laughs> Their root systems are crazy. A family friend had one of these that got run over for like two months when their neighbor was installing a pool, an in-ground pool, and it was getting run over by a bobcat for two months. And then the bobcat stopped and it was like, oh, oh okay, cool, I'm back, we're good now. And it came back, full form, if not with more vigor than before. So, very good, very hardy. Um, then you've got butterfly milkweed, okay? So this is another Asclepius genera host plant for? Yes, good, good class, this is great, okay. Butterfly milkweed, this cutie gets like two to three feet tall, it forms a bush. It also gets covered in these dreadful little aphids in the later part of the fall, which another digression that I could go on, but I won't. So when you are planting things like this that attract aphids, you're also attracting beneficial insects that eat those aphids, like longhorn beetles and other beautiful little parasitic wasps and things that are munching on these soft body insects. And having those predators around in your garden is only going to increase the overall vitality of your garden because diversity is key. So don't fight it. Um, it isn't that bad. And it won't kill, I mean, having, a, having these covered in aphids in the fall, it's not gonna, it's not gonna like kill it. These things, Asclepius tuberosa is what this thing is called. Now tuberosa, tuber, big old, fleshy tuber underground that allows it to come back year after year after year because it has stored nutrients, blah, 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 blah. Very hardy. Not as hardy as blue false indigo, but definitely up there. So, two to three feet tall, orange blooms, monarchs love it, a lot of things love it. Very good one. Now, Joe Pieweed is a really, really, really beautiful one. It's also called mist flower. This is a great addition to any rain gardens. Um, it does well decently well in medium to medium wet soil, um, as well as drier once it gets established. But this felt like it's like six feet tall, excuse me. Um, so it gets quite, quite tall, um, looming over. Now what you can do with these taller ones, um, which works pretty well, is to actually like cut them off halfway through the season. So if this is looming in the fall, like come July, just like cut it in half, and then it'll be like, oh okay, I guess I'm this tall this year. So you can kind of shape them a little bit, which is nice. But monarchs absolutely die for this thing. It's so, it's so great. And little bumblebees and so on and so forth. Um, lastly, for Eric's additions, uh, Landscape Coreopsis, um, which is very, very cute. Two to three feet tall, bright yellow flowers. They're so happy, so springy. Um, and finches love, love these. So if you like birds, plant some of these. Rabbits also like them. <laughs> I know, boo to rabbits. But, once you get them established, they're fine with a little grazing, okay? You can, you can share some of your salads, but definitely, <laughs> um, de definitely like look to either fence them or get a little like deer repellent, you know, don't stand downwind of the deer repellent because that smells, that stuff is awful, but um, protect it for that first year once it gets established. So that's the choreopsis. Any or questions planted on? in the neighbor's yard. Or planted in the neighbor's the yard. Go exactly, there. there we go. <laughs> That's great, I love it. Gorilla gardening. Um, now, now, I just want to say Dan, nor Cooley Region, nor WTC condones that kind of stuff. That kind of <laughs> Wink. But, yeah. So these are my, my five rock stars that I would add to that list in general to plant in your yards. So, 
Your education does not stop here with me at this, oh my God, it's been 45 minutes. Whoo, okay. Sorry about that. Um, you can learn more, because there's so much more to learn. I'm still learning plants that I didn't know, and I hope that that continues, because it would get really boring if I knew everything, and I hope you feel the same way. So, Driftless Area Natives, for continuing your education. That's me, I do have business cards here, and stickers. Um, so feel free to reach out at any point. I'd love to talk to you. Um, also, Prairie Moon Nursery, great website, wonderful filters where you can pick out the exact plant that you want to be two feet tall with pink blooms at the end of July. Like, it's just, it's really, really great. And they have a ton of seeds available, high quality seeds. Um, so if you're looking to buy seeds, Prairie Moon is up there for sure. They also have mail order um, plants that you can buy. Granted, they sell out like the end of February every year. It's uncanny. But Prairie Moon Nursery, very good. Prairie Nursery, don't confuse that with Prairie Moon. They are different. Um, Prairie Moon's in Minnesota. Prairie Nursery's in Wisconsin. So both really great resources. You can buy seeds from both of them. And then lastly, UW Extension um, has a lot of great resources on native plants. Um, a lot of great resources on native trees and shrubs to plant. We didn't even talk about shrubs in the landscape, but we could. Um, and that's a great resource to look into for learning about everything and all things in between. So I will open things up to questions now as the screen is blank. And that's my last slide. So yes. Hi. I just going to say don't forget seed savers down, yeah. down in the corner. Sure, definitely. Yeah, yeah, that's another great resource um, to look into. Yeah, uh, so I would love to plant all of these. I live on these little cross houses. I have about, you know, five feet on either side of my house. And, under, <laughs> and in part of that is my giant eaves underneath. Yeah. Yes. So, uh -huh. um, you know, like all great drought resistance and stuff. But I'm worried that if I plant them too close to my house, I am then going to have some problems with water in my basement when those great roots take hold. Is that something sure. I am going to need to worry about? Or, I mean, yeah. I don't know enough, but I've already had roots, tree roots in my sewer line, so I really, Ooh. I don't need more of no. that. No, no, um, no, I understand. Um, <laughs> so, do you have suggestions for smaller spaces? Yeah, um, I, I will say that like the, the prevalence of, um, so if you're, and just as a general sweeping statement, if you have moisture issues in your basement, um, it's most likely 99% of the time a result of inadequate grade away from your house, I right? Know that. <laughs> you, you know that. I got and, that and so, what the addition of plants can actually do if you have excessive moisture in certain areas is to actually soak up some of that water. Because, like, they don't want to sit in that stuff either, unless they're like marsh plants, and then you're planting things in the wrong spot and you got other issues. But um, as far as root systems of native plants interfering with sewer systems, electrical, I mean, Except for the blue false indigo, like don't plant that like on your cable line or something because it will take it over. But um, structural impairment as a result of these native plants is not something that we've we've ever ever experienced. So I will say like always plant anything you're planting, plant it a radius away from something that you don't want it to touch. Right. So like we see this not at Dan or WTC, but at Cooley Region. There are a lot of trees that are planted very, very close to houses, like three feet off the house. And you're like, that's not gonna work long term. So plant things a radius away. If it's gonna get 10 feet wide, plant it five feet off your house at least. Cause that way when it's fully grown, it's like, oh, this is great. I have enough room here. Does that make sense? So yeah, yeah a radius away. And then native plants like sedges and grasses will soak up moisture quite readily. Now, not much grows under eaves or overhangs, right? And so you might need supplemental watering in that situation if you want something to grow, unfortunately. But rocks are cool. <laughs> <laughs> and you can water them all you want, and they're just like, they just look different, so. Yeah, cool. Yeah, of course. Um, Eric, you mentioned a lot about native plants that, and, that are uh, sun. Are there any native plants that you recommend that that maybe have an area that's shadier? Totally. Um, so wild geranium is one of my favorites. Now, definitely put an asterisk next to that and say that you'll need to treat it with like um, at least for the first year while it gets established. Because, and I don't know what it is about rabbits that like when you plant something the first year, they're like, oh, this is 
right next to the same plant from four years ago, but I'm gonna eat this new one instead. So wild geranium, you'll wanna put some like rabbit repellent or deer repellent on while it gets established. Small that goes price into my next question. Rabbits, I know we talked about this. They're like, you know, I when people used to say they all look like rabbits, and I never really was like, what the I didn't know. Um, they're like they're like chewing up everything. Yeah. And I've said to Colin, like, and then someone said, well, plant something that they like, and then they'll leave your other things alone. Well, no, they don't because they eat that, and then they. Come. And then you have more rabbits. Yeah. So, sure. Well, if you build it, they will come. And I've used the stinky, the stinky deer rabbit guard, which is fine. But you have to keep putting one out there. Any, right. Any tricks for rabbits? Yeah, I mean, any any time, and so like I recommend this with the caveat that like we planted this with that very intention of preventing rabbits, and so generally you want to plant things that are aromatic or bristly or rough that are that would be imagine eating it, it would be terrible, right? So like anything in the bee balm family, um, you know, anything in the monarda or the mint family is aromatic, has square stems, generally rougher leaves, so they're not pleasant to eat. But we planted some, and a rabbit just eviscerated it for no reason whatsoever. Didn't even eat it. They just cut it off and laid it down next yeah. to the plant. And I was like, what kind of war are you trying to start right now? You know? Um, well, Ryan has a different idea of how to get a rabbit, but I know you don't like that. But, so, um, I never said I didn't like it. Like, <laughs> so, yeah. uh, you know him, so I know. you don't want to imagine what that is. But yeah, like, like, they literally like chew off stuff, and they're not even eating it. It's like, clipped off, and then it's laying there. And I'm like, they're just they're bored, right? So, I, don't know what they are. Um, I will say that we've seen when establishing like so, you know, we we'll see a lot of hostas planted, you know, and, and those things are usually not necessarily grazed by rabbits as much, but they are nipped on by deer, right? And so, um, with the hostas and those non-native plants that are like candy to a lot of these things, another deer candy plant is. Arborvita, if you've been, ever tried to plant uh, yes. that, we call that deer candy <laughs> in the landscaping world, because it is. Um, but with wild geranium, another one is Jacob's Ladder. These kind of plants, once you get them established and they colonize, for whatever reason, the rabbits are like, oh yeah, like you're like supposed to be here. We're not into that as much anymore. Once they get, it's just the first year where they're excited, they've got something new to taste, but then they lose their appetite. I promise. <laughs> Wild geranium, Jacob's Ladder, Blue Stem Goldenrod is a really, 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 really pretty one. It's also on the list of federally endangered plants, so we're trying to plant it as much as possible. Um, zigzag Goldenrod is really cool. If you need some taller stuff, um, Sweet Joe Pie Weed is one. I think it's like four to five feet tall, and it's actually related to the Joe Pie Weed, except this one grows in the shade. Um, so mist flower for your shade. Dwarf bush honeysuckle, shrubby St. John's wort are two shrubs that do well in shade as well. Or any dogwoods. Yeah? Got a list? I got a list. You got a pretty garden now. I'm a falconer and take out the rabbits. Well, that's a cool business proposition there. Who's who knows a falconer? We do. I don't know why. We'll talk. <laughs> Can I just share something that's worked for rabbits <laughs> for me? Um, is you can get like fencing that's about two feet tall and it's green, so it's kind of you know blends in with things. But I put that on my veggie garden and some flower gardens where I don't want the rabbits to get it. And then you know as the season goes along, the plants kind of hide uh -huh. the green fence, but the rabbits can't get in there. Yeah, that works pretty good. Yeah, it's like plastic coated. Yeah. But it's small enough that the rabbits can't get through it. Sedges. Thinkers. Write down sedges. Sedges. Sedges have. Grasses have. Yeah. Yeah. So. Speaking of keeping things away, um, we planted a, a native prairie like a couple of years ago. I'm pretty sure the first year the chickens ate all the seeds, and I've, I've kept them away now. But now I've got like flocks of like 
flat birds in my backyard, and I just can't keep them away. I'm worried they're eating only seeds. Right. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that is a pain. Um, so we planted in fall, but I haven't seen much more fun. So you could try. Um, Winter sowing is really popular. Prairie Moon has a really great tutorial on how to do that, where you're actually sowing the seeds on the ground before it snows, and then it snows over the top of the seeds and kind of yeah, crusts them, right? Yeah, we planted it in fall. So maybe they're buried in enough, but I don't they know. They might be. The they whole thing is covered in black. And I could think I work from home, so I can just run sure. out there every once in a while. What do you need me for? You got this. <laughs> Um, I mean, raking, raking it, raking in the seed, um, and even like walking on it. You know, you're kind of compressing yeah. the seeds down. I mean, unfortunately, like aside from putting a thick coat of straw or something over the top, like you're not going to prevent the bird from being able to burrow in there and get after the seeds. You know, I, I wish I had a trick. You could try Irish Spring soap. That seems to be the <laughs> recommended. Right. Catch all, be all for. Scarecrows don't actually work. I don't. You could try a scarecrow. I mean, I. The bunny sometimes chases away though. <laughs> 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 a little ecosystem you got. That's great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Raking in and, and okay. compressing would be the best. Yeah. Walk all over it. Yeah. Do anemones require a lot of uh, sun? Like the Canada anemone. Um, that's one that does pretty well in, you know, part, part shade, you know, like most of these benefit significantly from being more like four to six hours, right, of sun or like three to four maybe. Um, the biggest thing that, that you'll notice, aside from the plants just like dying, right, it's just significantly less flowering if you're used to more sun and they're in the shade, they're just going to be of a foliar nature instead, so it's a good one, Canada anemone. Um, how do you feel about the wild ginger in the serum, or does it not work? I, I mean, it depends what kind of, yeah. the, a wild ginger is in a serum canadensis. Right. Yeah, I mean, I love that one. That's one of my favorite ground covers for shade, which, wow, I didn't think of that. But, um, yeah, wild ginger is very, very good and once it's established. I haven't been in this area yet, so I had lots of different trillium. Do they not do well in this area? Wild, great. Trillions do great here. The, the biggest thing is like, and with a lot of those spring ephemerals, like they're one, they're more difficult to grow for nursery providers, and they're also like more successful if you're just selling them with seeds, you know. And the red or the white or just, mm -hmm. just okay. Yeah, buy some seeds, go crazy. Okay. Don't dig them up from parks. No, no, no. <laughs> what kind of soil does wild ginger eat? Um, it's one that does pretty well in a wide range of soils. We planted it in clay before we planted it in sand. Sandy. Um, the biggest thing to watch um, would be maybe add some compost in there so it stays a little more moist. It's not, it's not one that likes being totally dried out, okay. if that makes sense. But it also doesn't, like, doesn't need it to be wet. It doesn't want wet feet, but it also doesn't want desert. Yeah? It's a medium. <laughs> there we go. Any other questions? Yeah, don't don't be afraid to ask questions. That's why we're here. <laughs> no worries. So you you kind of gave a caveat with clover. What's the deal with like because I have dogs. Yo, okay. So I want to do something with my yard to hold it up so it's not just a dirt pile. Nice. But <laughs> not Turf. So I thought clover would be a good option, but it sounded like you were not excited about clover. I mean, I, I if you if you're gonna have lawn in your yard, you might as well make it somewhat ecologically beneficial by adding clover, right? Supplementation of clover also adds nitrogen to the soil, so like less fertilizer. Very good. I will say that like we have yet to find something that can withstand dogs. Okay, like just in general, like the only thing that survived has been astroturf, which I. Yeah. Don't plant astroturf. Uh, it's not native. Um, 
but, but yeah, supplementing in the clover, it doesn't even have to be just clover, it can be a mix. I got a free blend, so. Oh, cool. Sweet, okay. Red, white, no, it'll be great. Do you like it? Yeah, true. I don't see many, many browses. Sure. In the cross proper. Oh, Are there better clovers? Yeah, like I get what you're saying. Like you kind of said earlier, like clover is not from this area or something. Well, I mean, so like when you're buying clover mix for supplementation in your garden or in your yard, it's not. So the native clover from here is pale, is, uh, pale purple clover, little purple prairie clover, woo, um, or white prairie clover. You know, and those things, um, they're not quite what we're looking for when we think of clover in a lawn, right? They don't have, you can't find a lucky four each clover off the, of that purple prairie clover, sadly. But, um, like, typically it'll be Japanese white clover, which is very, very short, and it flowers very, very short. So, like, if you're in a yard and someone hasn't mowed in a while in Nomo Bay, which would be great, you'll probably see a lot of white little clusters, and those are almost almost always Japanese white clover, which Japanese, not Wisconsinese, so it's not from here, right? So, um, and then there's also Japanese red clover, and so there's a lot of, most of the clovers that you're supplementing in your garden or in your yard are not native because of their habits, so the way they grow, right? So, yeah. What do you think of, like, buffalo grass? I think it's sweet, if you can find it. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, even for me as a nursery owner, producer, like, I have been trying to find a source of seeds. Like, I could get a packet here and there, and like, I have one, I have one buffalo grass to sell, right? Because the seed quantities are so low. So, um, I think it's great. I mean, its root system is ridiculous for how short the grass above is. So, if you can find the seed, go crazy. Uh, it's very good. So. Can one visit Prairie Moon Nursery, or is it just? Yeah. I do believe you can visit Prairie Moon Nursery's gardens. Um, they're the same way as, as Dan, where they, they don't have a retail space, um, that you can't buy plants from there, you know? But I do believe they open things up to like tour their facilities. So give them a contact, it would be very cool to see. So. They set up the tour so often every year. They go and walk through the whole yeah. Cool. And you can still, they sell like a they walk into it and walk around. And their yard has like a whole other thing that just says, I do the chamber logs, but I do like to build seeds. Well, folks, oh, you got one more question. One more. I love that cup plant, and I'm afraid of it. With great power. If I have a very large container, how will they do it? Can I leave it out then? Will it work in a large container? In the back of the garden, I just would put it in there. Yeah. They do, so maybe not I mean, give it a try. I've never done it before, and it might work. You know, a lot of these, like, Coreopsis grows fine in containers. The granted, it doesn't have the deep tap root like the cup plant does, but what you'll probably end up finding is that, like, the cup plant is filled up your pot, and then it's also, like, shot through the drainage hole at the bottom. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> oh, well. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, give it a try. Why not? It doesn't, doesn't hurt to try. So, um, I would love to answer more questions from you, but I need to send you all home because it's 7.30, and... <laughs> It's my bedtime. So if you want to continue the conversation, I would love to. I'll leave business cards out over here on a table. Feel free to pick one up. Driftless Area Natives is on Facebook, and you can email me at that same thing. Got a website. Um, thank you all so much for coming tonight. It's been a pleasure.